San Francisco several weeks ago and blown away, Marv, by a sale that's going on. They got a sale that's, that's out of this world. And I find out the reason for the sale is because the stuff that is on sale was from the prior season. And they're getting ready for the next season. And so they are putting on sale anything that ain't going into the new season. It, it ain't going to work in the next season. So they got to put it on sale. I'm going to help y'all in just a minute. Because God is trying to move some of y'all into a new season. But you trying to carry some old stuff into a new season when God is saying you need to put that on sale on sale on sale so maybe tonight you should go through your phone and just look at your contacts and say sale 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 so you can profit from what was and embrace what's about to be Shall we pray? God, how we thank you and praise you that you are God and you are so good. We thank you that you have in grace kept us and blessed us to see another holy week where we, oh God, commemorate and celebrate your sacrificial love expressed so powerfully and lovingly in Jesus Christ. Oh God, how we thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he did for us what we did not deserve. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Thank you that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, but with his stripes we are healed. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity now to, to walk with him, to learn from his life as we, O oh God, reap the dividends of his death in anticipation of resurrection victory. And now that you have met us here and you have brought us here, we need a word from you. We need to hear from you. If we don't hear from you, what shall we do? So please, God, remove any distractions that may divert our attention. Don't let me or anything in me or about me get in the way of what you were up to and what you want to say and accomplish through me. Hide me behind the cross and help us to see Jesus. And we'll give you all of the glory and all of the honor. So stand in my body, take over my mind and think your thoughts. Take my mouth now and speak with power your word. Bless your word. Give power to your word. Let your word go forth with such power that none of us leave here the same way we came. Let your word go forth with such power that you revive us again. Let your word go forth with such power that you do exceeding abundantly. Above anything I can ask or imagine according to the power at work within me. In Jesus name, we thank you and praise you. Amen and hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. Our God is good. Our God is worthy of worship, and it is good to be here. I, I'm Peacock Proud and Honeymoon Happy to be back here at uh, the great uh, Calvary Church here in Jamaica, Queens. Of course, pastored my, by my beloved friend and brother, uh, the incomparable Pastor Victor T. Hall. I thank God for him, our friendship. Amen. And for his wonderful ministry, I am blessed and continue to be uh, challenged uh, by him uh, as he uh, models what, what it means to unite in holy wedlock, uh, good scholarship with spirit. And of course, we all know that he is a phenomenal uh, preacher and teacher of the word of God, so much so, amen, amen, so much so that I'm no... I'm not here because y'all are homiletically hungry or sermonically starving. Y'all get the best preaching every time he stands up. And so I thank God for him and for uh, the gift that he is and for his wonderful ministry. I am blessed to be here, of course. When I get to come here, I get to see uh, his beloved queen, uh, the one and only Marvela Hall. I thank God for Marv. She is marvelous. And... 
I just thank God for that dynamic duo of a, uh, of a couple. This country got all hype, and they should have been, about uh, Michelle and Barack, and we sure miss them now. Uh, amen. Uh, but before there was a Michelle and Barack, we had Victor and Marvelous. I thank God for, for them and, of course, for their beloved children, my godchildren. And then I'm really excited to be here because you all have such a phenomenal uh, office manager. Uh, and I'm, I'm, really, I'm really hyped about the new office manager here at Calvary. Uh, I guess she went back to the office. Where is she? She's here? Huh? Okay. All right. All right. So the office manager, there's the office manager. What's up? The office manager is in the house and uh, I am really blessed. Uh, please know this, uh, my favorite uh, and most challenging staff member uh, at Friendship West uh, through all of my 35 years uh, is now your office manager. Uh, and and I'll, I'll say it again, she was my favorite, my favorite. I mean, we did some uh, new things, exciting things that I never would have thought about us doing at the church. Uh, she keeps us uh, tied in to a new generation. Uh, so with that being the case, she's been my favorite uh, staff member. At the same time, she's been my most challenging uh, staff member. I've never met a staff member who knows more about uh, pastoring than me. And so uh, at my church, at my church. And so uh, I've been there 35 years and she is not 35, and yet she knows how to pastor Friendship West a whole lot better than me. And so uh, now that she's your office manager, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. <laughs> but very seriously, she is a gift. And uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm referring to uh, my lovely and wonderful daughter, Albany Jewel Haynes. She is a tremendous gift, and I appreciate her and love her so very much. There's the office manager. Good to see you, uh, Madam Office Manager. Also glad to see uh, Pastor Lisa uh, Jenkins. She is uh, something else. Lisa uh, blew my mind. She, um, the, there's a movie that just came out. I don't know if y'all saw it, called The Black Panther. And uh, so the movie comes out, you know, like one week, and then the next week I get this notification from Lisa uh, to download her book about the Black Panther. And I'm tripping, it's like, how do you write a book uh, in one week uh, about a movie that just came out the week before? And yet she did it, so you a bad Negro. I just wanna, that, that's, that, that blew my mind, that blew my mind. She could not have slept at all uh, during that time, but I appreciate her and I'm glad to see her. I wanna call your attention uh, this night to a passage of scripture found in the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 11. And there in the 11th chapter, beginning at the uh, 31st verse, we find the words of our text for this message. I'm gonna read in your hearing from uh, chapter 11, verse 31, through chapter 12, verse nine, from the New Living Translation of the 11th century vowed Hebrew text. It reads, one day Terah sent, took his son Abram, his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and his grandson Lot, his son Haran's child, and moved away from Ur of the Chaldeans. He was headed for the land of Canaan, but they stopped at Haran and settled there. Terah lived for 205 years and died while still in Haran. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Iran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran and headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as Shechem. There he set up camp beside the Oak of Moray. At that time, the land was inhabited by Canaanites. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there 
and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. After that, Abram traveled south and set up camp in the hill country with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. There he built another altar and dedicated it to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord. Then Abram continued traveling south by stages toward the Negev. I want to uh, put a tag on this text and for a few moments with your prayers. Based on verse 1, the Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I want to put a tag on this text, and in these few moments, I want to talk about where you're going ain't on the map. Where you are going ain't on the map. Life's greatest tragedy is to already be where you are going. These words continue to beckon and challenge me from the marvelous mind of my late mentor, Dr. Manuel Scott Sr. Again, life's greatest tragedy is to already be where you are going. It's possible to miss out on where God is taking you because you are stuck like Chuck on maps that have been designed for you. I see if I can illustrate this idea. The year was 2005. I had been invited to share for a minister's retreat in the hills of Southern California. I had flown into Los Angeles, the international airport there, and then I was picked up by my driver. The driver was taking me from LAX to this retreat site in the hills of Southern California. I was also greeted by the son of of the one who had invited me to participate in this retreat where ministers of the gospel would be dealing with and discussing issues of social justice, reuniting in holy wedlock as it were, Jesus with justice. And they had invited me to share during days of retreat. So when my flight landed in LA, I was greeted by the son of the one who was running the retreat who then escorted me to the ground transportation that would take me from LAX to the hills there in Southern California. My driver informed me that the ride would take some two and a half hours. That was cool because it was now 2.30 when I landed in Los Angeles and by the time five o'clock hit we would be at the campsite. My presentation was not to take place until 7 p.m. so I was cool with the out with the two and a half hour drive but when I got in the car immediately I was hit with sleeping sickness and so as a consequence I dozed off and went to sleep three hours later it's 5 30 and uh, I'm awakened by the fact that it seems like we are going around in circles and so I look and note that we had just passed an area that we had been to before and I didn't say a word but it happened again 15 minutes later. We passed an area that we had seen before and I noted, and please understand, this is 2005. There is no GPS that I have access to, let alone my driver. He is driving according to a map, a map. Now, most of you are too young to know what a map is because you've had GPS all your life, but, but a map, my sisters and brothers, is what he was utilizing in in order to get from LAX to the campsite. But now it's three and a half hours later. We're approaching 6 p.m. and the campsite is not in sight. And so I took the map out of his hands because Marv, he had the nerve to be checking out the map in his hands while driving with the other hand. And so I thought I would help him, deliver him from this precarious approach to driving. And I took the map out of his hands Hand, and I then said, okay, let me see where we are, only to discover that my eyes rolled down to the bottom of the map and looked at the copyright date. It said 1985. This is 2005. And so I asked the driver, I said, please tell me, when was this campsite constructed? He responded, it was constructed only a few months prior. It's a new site. The site is new, and yet the 
map is old and we were trying to get to a new place but we were depending upon an old map preach Freddie I'm about to do that because my sisters and brothers understand I had an assignment to fulfill I had a mission to accomplish but the mission was in a new place but I could not get to the new place because the person I was with was depending on an old map in order to get me to a new place I'm not even done to make matters worse understand that where I was going was not on the map what I had been called to do in that season was not on his map and as a consequence we were going in circles going where we had already been because we were depending on an old map I park here parenthetically because it could be in 2018 that God is moving in your life and in my life and God is calling us beyond old maps to go where we never saw ourselves going God is moving God is doing a new thing and if you are not careful you will allow an old map to cause you to go in circles and miss out on where God is trying to take you I'm preaching it y'all just not feeling me and so watch this my sisters and brothers all of us if we are not careful have old maps that try to tell us what we can do and where we can go what's your old map was that old map what somebody said to you as a child that still haunts you and handcuffs you what is your old map is that old map the way things used to be done and you think that because they were done that way they've got to always be done that way because that's the only way that you know that is an old map I'm still not coming through maybe your old map is dysfunction in your family behind you that has limited how you operate in the world around you that is an old map old maps my sisters and brothers aren't working in 2018 is that not a word for people of faith and the body of Jesus Christ because in too many instances we are stuck doing old things and old way in a nation that is no longer a Christian nation I hope you understand by now that Christianity is in decline in this country and so many have been turned off by the church in all of their scandals and greed and standing on the wrong side of history and justice that there are many in a generation that will gladly say they are not religious but they are spiritual meaning they still believe in a connection with God but they do not trust religious institutions that have broken their hearts and left too many of them wounded in a real sense they ain't hanging out on the old church map and if we are not careful we will miss out on what God is doing in 2018 because we're stuck on the map of 1918 y'all still not trying to feel me I'm going to push this thing a little bit further because maps my sisters and brothers can haunt us and handcuff and cuff us and preclude us from fulfilling the possibilities that God has for us I see if I can make it plain because surely you will agree with me that black people in this country are haunted and handcuffed by the old maps of racism in what Maya Angelou called these yet to be United States of America I'll quote Jimmy Baldwin James Baldwin threw it down like this now as then we are still watch this locked up by the nature nature of our categorizations first without and then within y'all didn't get Jimmy B so let me give you Jay Z Jay Z says blindfolded expected to walk a straight line mind molded taught to love you but hate mine y'all still not getting this I'm trying to say these are old maps and these old maps aren't going to help us negotiate the new world we find ourselves in I'm still not coming through I guess I'll throw it down like this all of us should be sick and tired and not shocked by what we have heard in recent days about the criminality of our justice 
justice system where Alton Sterling's murderers are going to get off there in Louisiana, in Sacramento, California. Stephon Clark is no longer alive, shot dead 20 times in his own backyard. There he is, dead now. And I'm simply saying, my sisters and brothers, it's shocking that it's still a reality. And there are many people who were saying it's 2018. I can't believe this is still happening. Well, it happened in 2017, in 2016, in 2015, in 2014. Hell, when you gonna believe it's still happening? It's happening because there are old maps that are trying to preclude us from operating in this new world. I'm still not coming through. I see if I can help you. Do you not know, my sisters and brothers, that no one less than Oprah Winfrey put it like this to be black and male in this country is to be labeled a suspect. There it is. That's the old map. If you have a black body, you are labeled a suspect. You are perceived as a threat. That's the old United States map. Y'all still not getting this, are you? That's the map that too many people still operate off of. It's a map that labels us in order to limit us. It profiles us in order to persecute us. It's a map, my sisters and brothers, that is designed to confine us. Well, with that being the case, I couldn't wait to jump into this passage in light of the season we find ourselves in because this is Holy Week. And isn't God amazing? Because next week we're going to commemorate the martyrdom of the drum major for justice, Martin Luther King Jr. And you do understand that Martin King, my sisters and brothers, whatever else you want to say about his ministry he refused to stay on the map. Martin King where he went took us off the map. Y'all miss your shout I'll see if I can help you. The year is 1963 it's the Birmingham campaign and he had been invited to Birmingham by Fred Shuttlesworth and Fred Shuttlesworth invites him to Birmingham in order to fight a Jim and Jane Crow segregation here's what went down the movement is not gaining steam because Birmingham is entrenched in its racism and doing things the way they had been. As a consequence, King comes and when he gets there, the preachers in town are not pleased. The business people ain't pleased. And he gathers in the living room of his motel suite at the Gaston Motel. Check out what went down. It's Easter. It's Holy Week. And his dad has come from Atlanta along with Benjamin Elijah Mays and they have a conversation with Dr. King. Daddy King wants Martin to come back to Atlanta. Why? Because that Sunday is Easter. It's the largest day on the Christian calendar but Martin Dutto doesn't want to leave Birmingham and so he has all of these people in his ear. There are business persons telling him that Birmingham is too tough. Daddy is saying let's come home because you've got to preach on Sunday. I got a question for you. What do you do when you don't know what to do and you got all these people in your ear trying to tell you what's best for you? That's what King was up against. But here comes your shout because King, here it is, gets up from the living room, goes into his bedroom, shuts the door behind him, and then sometime later he comes out dressed in blue jeans. Why? Because while he was in his bedroom, he had falling on his knees. No. He had taken a knee. He had talked with God and God had told him to go off of the map and when he went off the map, he got arrested. Understand, he's manhandled, placed in solitary confinement in Birmingham jail. Listen, he had heard from God and we walked right into a jacked up situation. I parked right there because every now and then you will hear from God and think everything is supposed to be smooth only to walk into a jacked up situation. Y'all playing like y'all not feeling me. 
But is there anybody here who can say, Freddie, you and my Kool-Aid, you just called my flavor. I'm trying to do what God wants me to do, and yet I walk into a situation that's even more jacked up. I'm wondering if I've done the right thing. I'm not even done. Because King is placed in solitary, but then Sunday comes, and when Sunday comes, he gets word that some preachers on the wrong side of history had written an open letter to him in the Birmingham paper and they labeled him an outside agitator because of the protest that he was leading. I gotta shout you right quick. Doesn't it blow your mind that people of privilege always have the nerve to critique the protest of those who don't have privilege? Now how you gonna critique me for not having what you have and all I'm trying to do is get what you enjoy but you so busy enjoying what you have that you ain't got enough sense sensitivity or spirituality to look beyond what you have to see I ain't got what you have and as a consequence I'm a protest to get what you have because I'm a deserving child of God y'all not getting this but does it not blow your mind that people will critique protest movements. They will critique Colin Kaepernick. They will talk about Eric Reed. They will talk about NFL players who decide to take a knee and yet they don't deal with the issues that they took a knee to begin with. I'm just trying to say they will put you on their map. And so King doesn't go home for Easter, but he experiences resurrection. I'm going to do that one more time. Because a whole lot of folk will come to church for Easter, but they won't experience resurrection. Preach Freddie Haynes. I'm doing the best I can. Just because you show up and dress up for Easter, it don't mean you experience resurrection power. Resurrection power, according to Miles Jones, is being that should not be. I'm going to give you one more time to share out on that. Resurrection power says that you be when you shouldn't be. It means you show up when you're not expected to show up. Resurrection power means you keep bouncing back up because God gives you the resilience and the resources to bounce back up when life has knocked you down. Is there a shout in the house who will say that's my testimony when I look at all the hell I've been through when I think about some junk I've had to overcome I am being that should not be I ain't got to dress up for Easter to know the power of the resurrection I'm preaching y'all just missing your shout cues I keep this thing going you know how I know King experienced resurrection because Wyatt T. Walker and, and his attorney they brought uh, the newspaper to King and King began to scratch his response in the margins of it it became known as the letter from Birmingham jail y'all miss your shout right there the shout is that when he's in jail and under attack because he is off the God gives him revelation and resources and responds with this letter that is attacking him because God will use what squeezes you to squeeze a blessing out of you that wouldn't have been squeezed had you not been in a bad situation. Is there anybody here who can say that's my testimony? If I had not been jacked in that situation, it would not have brought out of me what God had placed in me. And so King does that because he marches off the map and, and that's the testimony of my man Abram in our text Abram and Sarah the book says they marched off the map don't you love it they marched off the map because God had called Abram in a time of chaos and controversy alienation and dissension it's a crazy time how do I know because when you read chapter 11 in its context you discover it's the same chapter as the Tower of Babel and so now we're in a time of turmoil and trouble a time of chaos and confusion and in that context God issues a call to Abram and Sarai y'all still not shouting it's a crazy time I guess y'all not connecting the dots I'll do it for you this is a time of turmoil and trouble chaos and confusion a time of division and dissension that's the world we live 
live in right now. Why? Because we have sank into a trump hole. A trump hole. Y'all don't know what a trump hole is? Well, I'll break that thing down for you. A few weeks ago, he had the arrogant audacity, I'm speaking of 46 minus 1, to refer to countries of color as S-holes. Well, S-holes, you know what S stands for. And so since America wouldn't be America had it not deposited its excrement in the toilet of those countries, then in a real sense, America has become America because of the genius of black folk who built it for free. As a matter of fact, if you want to know what Wakanda is, Wakanda is according to according to many black scholars, Wakanda is what Africa would be if white folk had left us alone. Preach Freddie Haynes, I just did. Because all of that genius would still be on the mother continent, but because you decided to deposit your waste in Africa as you stole the land and gave us your version of Christianity. But I'm here to let you know that instead of calling it s hole, let's call this nation a Trump hole. Because whenever somebody comes for you wrong, what you ought to come back, clap back at them and say, you ain't Trump. Because when you're saying you ain't Trump, you're simply our understanding uh, the synonym of S with Trump and since there's such appropriate synonyms why don't you tell them to get the Trump out of your face And so understand, my sisters and brothers, that, that in our text here is Abram. It's a time of chaos and controversy, division and dissension. I guess, again, it's reflective of our time because we are now in the shadow. We, are, we have witnessed in this country the eclipse. I think Cornel West says of decency, honesty, and integrity. And that's left us in the chaotic shadows of what? Emboldened racism, unvarnished greed not to mention predatory patriarchy as well as military madness all of that characterizes the turmoil and trouble of this nation but look at God God says in turmoil and trouble that's when I will call an Abram and Sarai to do something brand new you still missing your shout here it is the shout is according to Walter Brueggemann that the call of Abram and Sarai is not simple the forming of a new nation Israel it's the reforming of humanity for the transformation of the world because Brueggemann says that God is calling Abram and Sarai to give birth to a new nation that will be a new paradigm for what nations ought to do and that is that nations ought to be blessings to other nations if they want to make themselves great I ain't coming through, but I am preaching. So I'll go ahead and show you how this thing works because God is calling you off the map. Where you going ain't on the map. What God is doing in your life, it ain't on the map. I don't care what other folk have told you you're supposed to be doing. It could be that God is calling you off the map of their job description for your life. Be careful about allowing someone else to draw up a job description for your life when their life is whack. And so make sure that you recognize God has a plan for your life and where God is taking you may not be on the map. I'll see if I can make this plain. This morning I flew here from Dallas Fort Worth and here's what happened Vic I flew out of terminal A since I got there in plenty of time I decided to go by watch this marvel in honor of your girl Deb I decided to go by the Admirals Club so I go by the Admirals Club only to discover it is shut down it's not open in terminal A in that area why because it's under construction the doors are shut it's noisy and the process of construction is underway don't miss your shit out. The process of construction is underway, so I can't get in what I used to get in. I can't enjoy what I was looking forward to enjoying because they are under construction. I'm not even done. There's a picture, watch this, of what they are constructing, but what messes me up is not the picture, it's the caption beneath the picture. The caption says, we are reimagining what the 
Admiral's Club will look like in 2018. I talked too fast because I gave y'all a shout. You just missed it. I do it one more time. Right now, it's inconvenient. Right now, doors are shut, but there's a process going on, and the process is going to eventuate in the manifestation of what the sign says. We are imagining, we are reimagining what the Admiral's Club will look like in 2018. Come here because that's your shout. You've been trying to figure out all the chaos, all the shut door stuff ain't going the way you want it to. God is saying, I have reimagined what your life is going to look like going forward. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of men and women the good things that God has in store for them. God is taking you off the map. So how does it work? I'm almost done. The text says when God takes you off the map, where are you going? Ain't on the map. The text says to begin with, and this is going to shout you right here, that you can't move forward until you leave some stuff behind. You didn't get that, did you? Uh, uh, uh. There's some stuff you've got to leave behind if you want to move forward. Uh, uh, if you want to embrace what's in the future, you've got to let go of what's in the past. I'm still not coming through, am I? I love, I love, I love how, 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 who is it? Drake puts it, Drake goes down like this. Drake says real strength is not so much in what you hold on to. It's what you learn to let go of. I like that right there. I got to go back to Jay again. Jay-Z, tell us how it works. A loss ain't a loss. It's a blessing. Every even learn to embrace the embrace the pain it's a blessing why is he saying that because sometimes we experience losses in order for us to profit there are profits in your losses y'all not getting it i gotta go to the text look what the text says the text messes me up because the text says in verse one of chapter 12 that god had past tense god had called abram out of Ur, but something happened between verse 31 of chapter 11 and verse 1 of chapter 12. What happened, Freddie Haynes? I'm glad you asked. The text says that Tara, Abram's daddy, had left with them to go to what? Uh, to go to Canaan. But the book lets us know that when they came to Haran, they settled there. You didn't shout. They settled for less than what God had called them to. And because they settled for settling, the text lets us know that they stayed there until Abram's daddy, Terah, died. And once Terah died, that's when God spoke again. And the text says God had told Abram to leave Ur, to leave your family, to leave everything behind you and go to a land I'm going to show you. Y'all missed it. He said, leave all of that behind. But because he didn't leave it behind, the text says his dad went with him. And when they got to Haran, that's when they settled because his dad was not in on what God had revealed to Abram. And because of that, Abram settled for settling. And because he settled for settling, he had to experience the loss of his dad to profit off of God's promises. And here is where God always blows my mind. And that is a loss ain't a loss. It's a blessing. I love that right there. Just because you lose something or someone it doesn't mean that's the end of your life God ain't done and God ain't dead as a matter of fact what gets me a hype about what God can do in spite of all of the losses we are experiencing as a people is to remember that God has always been able to take a tragic murder and transform it into a transformational movement I guess y'all don't know your history so I got to help y'all but y'all do recognize that Emmett Teal was killed August 28th 1955 and his mama decided to expose the hypocrisy of American democracy and she kept the casket open at his funeral and all of the world saw his mutilated body and what racism had done to him and Rosa Parks noted the courage of Mama Teal and December 1st 1955 
when Rosa refused to give up her seat, she was thinking, she said, about Emmett Till and her and his mama. And that began the 381 day Montgomery bus boycott. Y'all miss your shout. A tragic murder birthed a transformational movement. Y'all didn't get it. Let's go to 1963. I think it's June 12th when Medgar Evers gets killed in his driveway in Jackson, Mississippi while trying to register black folk to vote. The very day, the very next day, John Kennedy gets on the television and talks about passing civil rights legislation, but it does not happen immediately. For four girls are slain in the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, September 15th, 1963. November 22nd, Kennedy is killed in Dallas, Texas, and Lyndon Johnson, a Southerner, becomes president and makes it his political priority to pass the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. A tragic murder became a transformational movement. Y'all still didn't shout. I got to keep it going. It's Freedom Summer 64 and Schwerner, Goodman, and Shaney get killed there in Mississippi, February 65. Deacon Jimmy Lee Jackson gets killed in Selma, Alabama. But you know what happened, don't you? Because those marches, they marched from Selma through Bloody Sunday all the way to Montgomery hearing LBJ say, and we shall overcome. And you know what? It gave birth to the Voting Rights Bill of 1965. Tragic murders became a transformational movement. Y'all still not shouting. I guess I got to give y'all the best one. There was a tragic murder that took place 2,000 years ago. It took place on a hill far away. Stood an old rugged cross and my Bible says they nailed my Jesus. They, they hung him high and stretched him. Well, I guess y'all don't know about that tragic murder. He died on Friday but got up on Sunday and now I'm a part of his transformational movement because God can take a tragic murder and make it a transformational movement. So let's tell the families of Trayvon Martin and Tamir Rice. Tell the families of Sandra Bland. Tell the families of my man in Sacramento. Tell the families of, the, of Eric Garner here in New York. God ain't done. God ain't did. A movement is about to be set loose. God is about to do a new thing. Where we going ain't on the map. It ain't on the map. It ain't on the map. So you got to let go of some stuff to embrace where God's taking you. You didn't shout. Uh, I'm about to get y'all then. Uh, Cause you said, okay, what, what does that have to do with me personally? I'm glad you asked. Uh, 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 when, I'm, when I was growing up, I got turned on in my neighborhood to garage sales. I don't know if y'all have garage sales here in, in the NYC, but, but garage sales, check this out. A garage sale is when a family is about to make a move. And so they don't want to bring some stuff, but they want to profit from it. Okay, okay. They're about to move to a new space, and they don't want to take old stuff to the new space. So they have a garage sale. Y'all didn't shout, okay, okay. I'm in San Francisco several weeks ago and blown away, Marv, by a sale that's going on. They got a sale that's, that's out of this world. And I find out the reason for the sale is because the stuff that is on sale was from the prior season. And they're getting ready for the next season. And so they are putting on sale anything that ain't going into the new season. It, it ain't going to work in the next season. So they got to put it on sale. I'm going to help y'all in just a minute because God is trying to move some of y'all into a new season. But you trying to carry some old stuff into a new season when God is saying you need to put that on sale on sale on sale so maybe tonight you should go through your phone and just look at your contacts and say sale 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 so you can profit from what was and embrace what's about to be 
You better preach for the Haynes. I'm doing the best I can. I'm going to rush on here. Watch the text. The text goes on to say, Abram, watch this. He, he leaves what was to embrace what's next and lets us know that is that God is so wonderfully and powerfully good that God says, don't allow the disappointments of the past or the predicament in your present to blind you of the possibilities in your destiny. I love that right there because look what the text says. The text text says that Abram is told by God, leave your family, leave your old land, leave all of that behind you because I'm going to make you and Sarai the parents of a nation. You didn't shout. Abram and Sarai. Abram is what, 70, 80 years old? Sarai, 60, 70 years old? Abram, pre-Viagra, is about to be the father of a nation. Sarai, y'all missing your shout. This ain't even menopause. She's put men on pause because she is now, what, 70 years old. And God says, y'all about to be the parents of a great nation. Don't you let your disappointment from the past. I know you've tried to have kids in the past and it did not work. But your past disappointment can't blind you to what God is about to do in your future. Don't let your present predicament, your issues, issues, issues all of us got issues okay tweet this if you don't shout Vic Mensa he was on the tour with Jay-Z and Vic Mensa had a line that messed me up he said I got so many issues I could be my own publisher I had to preach right there huh because all of us got enough issues to be our own publisher Abram Sarai they got issues but the text says, in spite of their issues, God says, I've got a promise that's greater than your past, a promise that's greater than your issues. So don't allow your past or your present to blind you to the promise I have for your life. I love that right there. That, that, that makes me think about, uh, I think my wife is coming tomorrow and, 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 and just tell her this because I want to let y'all, you, you tell her this, okay? So, so, so I'm married to my wife but she's in love with Denzel Washington, okay? And I get that, I get that. She's married to me, but she loves Denzel, you know, okay. So she, 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 she's married to me. So the secret of 30 years is that whenever Denzel has a movie, come out, we're there the first night. Because that, that's, how, that's how you stay, that's how you stay. She, and so, so even when he was on Broadway, I should tell y'all this, on Broadway, he was on Broadway, so we came up here, came up here, went with the halls to see Denzel on Broadway. And do you know that your first lady and my wife pushed their children to go get autographs from Denzel at the end of the play. And they stood in the back blushing and, and looking while pushing their little kids to go get the autograph from Denzel. That ain't in my sermon, but I had to drop that on you. Okay, Marv? So, so watch what happened. So Denzel, watch this. Denzel was doing a marketing tour for, for a recent movie. And here's what messed me up. He's being interviewed by Ed Gordon. Ed Gordon is wrapping up the interview. Last question. It's going to shout you. Denzel, please let me know what do you think is your greatest performance ever and of course because I'm married to someone who loves him I knew I had to rush through and find out anticipate what would Denzel say surely Denzel could say what training day after all he played a thug and you know what happened he won the best actor award but really he should have gotten it for Malcolm X because he didn't play Malcolm he became Malcolm you've been had you've been hoodwinked bamboozled run amok I mean he did that thing and so when 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 Ed Gordon says what was your greatest performance I knew he'd say one of them but he didn't Denzel shot back at Ed Gordon my greatest performance is my next one because anybody who walks with God knows that God's greatest performance ain't been played yet. God says my greatest performance is my next one. Y'all playing like y'all not getting it. So 
I went Ed Gordon on God and I interviewed God. I said, yo, God, I'm about to preach at Calvary Baptist Church. I want to tell them about your best performance. God was your greatest performance in the beginning when you created something out of nothing and cosmos out of chaos. And God said, that was cool, but that wasn't my best performance. I, God, well, what about when you created humanity out of the dust of the earth? That was really hot right there, but it still wasn't my best. I, God, I got you. What about at the sea, what we call the Red Sea, and you made a way out of no way? God said, that was kind of hard, wasn't it? But that still wasn't my best. I got you, God. What about when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got thrown in the fire because they would not bow during the Babylonian national anthem? God said, oh, that was cool too. But that wasn't my, okay, I got you now, God. I, I know your best performance. When Jesus was dead for three days and you got him up out of the tomb and God said, yeah, that was kind of hard right there, but it still wasn't my best. I said, okay, God, when's your best performance? God said, my next when eyes have not seen ears have not heard y'all didn't shout beloved now are we the sons and daughters of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be but when we see him we gonna be just like him because we'll see him as he is God ain't done with you yet God is still doing something new and where you're going ain't on the map Hold on, Doc. I ain't there yet, okay? I ain't there yet. I'll get there in about five minutes, okay? So give me five more minutes. I promise you I'll be right there. Watch what the text says next. In the final analysis, the text says God is so absolutely amazing. Here's your shout right here. God says make sure you have a faith that is portable. Here's your shout. You didn't get it. Did you check out the bottom of the text when the text said that everywhere Abram went, he erected a tent and built an altar? You didn't shout. Wherever he went, he erected a tent. That's where he stayed. But he also built an altar because his faith was portable. His faith, when I was coming up at Third Baptist in San Francisco, we had hymn books in the back of the pew stamped with these words, not to be removed from church. We have a whole lot of folk, that's how your religion is. Not to be removed from church. But when you know God for yourself, your faith is not to stay in church. You come to church to get refueled. You come to church to take your faith and live your faith in a crazy hell of a world. Oh, I get it. I know what's going on. Because I'm preaching my heart out. Get ready. I'm preaching my heart out. And in preaching my heart out, I just know y'all to be just running out of here by now, especially on, on God's best. I, I, I knew y'all to be done. Y'all be through. But y'all ain't through because this is Victor Hall. Victor Hall is such a teacher preacher. Y'all know how to hear a sermon. And I've told y'all about this. When you hear a sermon, what do you do? You listen, getting ready to shout. Some churches listen, ain't got enough sense to shout. Other churches shouting, and you know they ain't listening. But here at Calvary, y'all listen, getting ready to shout. And, and y'all are on the edge of your pews wanting to shout, ready to shout. But you're listening so well, and your listening is a product of your thinking. And you know what thinking does. Thinking will make you shout because thinking is real closely related to thinking. The more you think about how good God is, the more you thank God for being good as God has been. Can we have a think party right quick? Think about some of the stuff God brought you through that you wouldn't have come out of had God not thank you. Think about how God opened up some doors you didn't even knock on. Thank you. Think about how God saved your soul. Thank you. Think about how God gave you chance after chance after chance after chance. Think about when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all oh, he's done for me. So here it is. Y'all are thinking, and I feel you. You're listening and you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Freddie Haynes, don't you leave Calvary tonight until you tell us, did you get to speak at the retreat site when where you were going was off the map? And y'all be.